Hello, I'm Sarah Bansomer. My husband and I produce a program called Painting and Travel. My husband's an artist, and I have the pleasure of doing a travelogue where I get to meet an interesting person. The interesting person here is Darren Richeson, who is the president of the Jack Richeson & Company, composed of not only the manufacturing plant, which is quite incredible, but an art gallery as well as an art school. And earlier, when we walked through the factory, I was fascinated to see it's almost like a, a kitchen where they have the big pots and they're mixing the paint and things are measured out very carefully. It was very clean in there and uh, quality control was um, a high priority. I, I think it really is akin to, to cooking. You can take you know, two cooks with the same set of ingredients and end up with two really different outcomes. And with artist colors uh, in particular, it just, requires you to be very meticulous, very precise, uh, and to really study your, your paint batches from one, from one batch to the next and make sure you control the quality. Well, you know, if you compare it to cooking, sometimes uh, cheaper food items have a lot of filler in it. Yeah, there are definitely, if you're trying to make a less expensive product, you can put uh, a variety of different fillers into it, waxes and uh, different, different things to remove pigment to make it, to make it um, you know, simpler to produce. Kelly Richardson is in charge of paint production here, and she can tell us how you get from the organic color pigment to the tube. We, well, we begin by mixing the pigment with oils. We mix a blend of safflower and linseed oil. Um, different pigments get different blends of it. We also put in a stabilizer, which helps the pigments stay suspended through the oils. And you buy these pigments from uh, different locations that have the proper color, the proper mineral to... Correct. We have many different manufacturers that we buy from. Um, this particular one is bought from a company out in West Virginia. Um, it's a burnt sienna, and burnt sienna comes from all over the world. We just chose this particular one. Um, after we mix the oils, we mix them for about four hours, then we mill them. In the milling process, you break apart the pigment particles into smaller particulates. This is where you get your nice true color from. After we mix, mix it and mill it, it sits and rests for a minimum of 45 days. This allows any excess oil to be released from the pigments. Um, every pigment comes with an oil absorption rating, and we try to fill it with as much oil as possible that the pigment will allow. After those 45 days, we then fill the tubes. This is done with a piston filler. The piston filler is a semi-automated machine, and um, we actually have a hand operator who puts the tubes in place, and then um, they get put on a crimping machine, which also puts a batch number on it, so we can identify every single one of our batches. I like your quality control here. You really have your eye on everything. We do. We choose to make smaller batches, then we can actually control them much more. I know earlier you were telling me that there was a, a, a part of the process called calcining it. That's how raw sienna gets to burnt sienna. The manufacturer actually heats the raw sienna up until a certain temperature and as it calcines it becomes darker and darker which gives us the wonderful reddish brown burnt sienna we know today. I see like coffee roasting. Kind of like coffee Light roasting. To dark. Yeah. <laughs> well I want to look around and see how the operation progresses from here. This is the paint lab. I call it uh, Kelly's Kitchen where she cooks up the colors. It's like an industrial strength mixer here. Uh, what's happening in there? What, what color is that? This is Hansa Yellow Light, and this is our planetary mixer. The planetary mixer has a lot of horsepower, but it mixes nice and slow. These will mix for about four hours. And this is going around, and then you've got the blades inside? Correct. They turn one way, and they are able to turn the other is with the mixer. And for several hours, this mixes, and then you get what you want. You we get what we want to go on to the mill. I see. This is called the milling process. It's the next step after the paints are mixed. Here the paints continue to be processed and the already fine particles of pigment are further broken down and crushed several times through a small clearance between these heavy rotating rollers until it reaches a creamy consistency. When we produce our, our paints, we actually want the pigment to dictate what the paint will look like and to feel like so that 
uh, you know, one particular color of blue might be very different in consistency to some other color in the line because we don't want to try to alter the pigment so that everything has the same feel. We want the, the, the paint really to dictate what the, what the consistency of the product's going to be like. I see. So a different color might have its own voice. Absolutely. I know sometimes when um, Roger's teaching a class and he has some students that are trying to save money um, on brushes and paint, what happens is really it's a disaster for the student because you can't get quite the line you need if you have a lousy brush, an overused brush, uh, and same thing with the paints. If they're not really covering in the manner you want them to or if they don't have some body, um, your painting isn't a good. Yeah, it's, it really is. Um sort of a, a full savings to go with an inexpensive paint. Uh, one, less expensive paints will have less covering power because you have more filler in there. So even when you have an expensive color like a cadmium or a cobalt, on the surface you may perceive that you're saving money, but being that most uh, paints tend to get cut with uh, fairly inexpensive white, you're gonna use so much more of an inexpensive color to tint your, your, your color that you're trying to reach than you will if you just use a better, a better quality paint from the beginning.